Cambridge crimes. Vanished into the dark. Told and researched by Fonz Chamberlain. Richard Peake lived in the High Street, Caxton, with his mother, Martha, aged 45, his sister, Anne, aged 11, and brother, William, aged 5. His father, James Peake, had died, and the family were finding themselves during hard times. In 1851, the Cambridgeshire County Police Force was formed, and it was not long before Richard was showing some interest in securing himself a wage to help the family as an officer. He applied and was appointed as constable on the 15th of December 1852. Richard was given some training at the police headquarters and then was posted to a station in Burwell. He was allocated the responsibility for the nearby village of Wickham. In 1854, he married Anne Dennis Cooper and was given permission to live with her in Burwell. Their first child, Sydney, was born soon after the marriage. It was on the evening of Friday the 17th of August, 1855, he was ordered by his sergeant to police an auction of crops that was being held at the Lyme Public House in Wigan. He had commenced his tour of duty in Burwell, where he would have paraded for inspection of his uniform and produced his appointments, which would have been his handcuffs and truncheon. He was to work through the night, finishing his shift at 5am. It was understood the peak left in his uniform as he set off to walk the two miles from Burwell to Wickham. The auction would end around 9pm, but the event saw the opportunity for farmers and labourers to use it as a social occasion. Most would have been drinking during the evening and would continue until it was time to go home. The landlord of the Lyme Public House was William Cranwell. When questioned following Pig's disappearance, he said, the officer had made periodic visits to the bar during the evening. He described how Peake was not in uniform at any of those times. The landlord, Cranwell, further stated that Peake had been drinking. He tried to make light of it by stating that he had served him with a pint of beer and a shilling's worth of brandy and water in the house altogether. Of course, landlord and customers were not unknown to treat constables to a drink in hope that they may turn a blind eye to any minor misdemeanours. Of course, some officers were also willing partners in minor conspiracies as it felt it helped rather than hinder their reputation for fairness and impartiality. Cromwell, of course, described Peak as being perfectly sober. Other witnesses stated that when the auction finished there were about 45 people in the bar and Peak was present, moving between the bar and the garden. During the evening there was some trouble amongst a group of customers who had an heated argument. Peak of course identified himself as a constable to them and ejected two of the troublemakers. It is believed that he remained at the line until 2am when he told the landlord that he was leaving. However, it was not until the bar had cleared at 3.15am that Peak finally said to Cranwell, Good morning, I've got an hour and a half's walk and then I'll go to bed. Back then, before he could finish his tour of duty, Peak 
was required to meet with his sergeant at a point which they had both fixed for 4 a.m. in Burwell. Of course, to miss this or be late was a disciplinary offence. Of course, these meetings would have served in the day long before pocket radios and public telephones and it would allow supervisors an opportunity to check the work of their officers ensuring that they were alert and on their beat. It also meant that the constable's pocket book in which he would record events of the evening during his shift could also be checked and signed off. In the event of an officer failing to make the point, the alarm could be raised. Peak failed to appear at 4am at the Greed Point in Burwell. Witnesses later recounted that at this hour three men were seen fighting in Wigan near the pub. The witness could not say if one of them was the officer. It was dark at that time and if one of them was indeed Peak he may have still been out of his uniform because he had not allowed much time for his return walk from Wickham to Burwell, it is reasonable to assume that he had planned to change somewhere along the direct route. This would have taken him via footpaths across the fields rather than on the longer road route. It is not known if he did manage to change back into his uniform before he met his fate. When he failed to make it to the meeting point, checks were made at the line and at his home without any result in locating him. The route across the fields where he could have also walked was also checked. By the following Monday morning, concerns for Peak had mounted. The Chief Constable had been informed of his disappearance and decided to personally supervise the search for him. The search went on for several days and officers were drafted in from other areas to assist. Local residents also played their part. Many people were interviewed and gave their accounts but it all led nowhere. The inquiry even extended as far as a lady in Brine with whom Peake had supposedly been familiar with. She was trace, but was unable to assist. Police stations around the country were notified of the disappearance. Peak was never seen again. He had effectively vanished from the face of the earth. He left a wife and one child. His wife bore their second child, Alfred, some time after. One local lady told searching officers that on the morning Peak went missing, she walked past the brick kiln at Burwell Fen, where she noticed a very peculiar and disagreeable smell. The kiln was thoroughly checked, but no clues were found. In 1856, a local man was on his deathbed and asked for an officer to call because he was anxious and wanted to clear his conscience. He stated that Peak had been murdered by being knocked on the head. The man said he knew who had done it, but declined to name any names. He was adamant that he himself had not carried out the crime. He added that Peak had been carried to the brick kiln in Burwellfem, where his body was destroyed. It is not known how reliable this account could be, for rumours about the brick kiln were by then common knowledge. At the time of his disappearance, Peak would have been well aware of activities of a gang that were terrorising the area around Wiccan, Upware, Reach and Burwell. The gang was known as the Fen Tigers and were believed to be responsible for much of the local crime. Such a gang would have little tolerance for the interference of an officer of the law. It's believed the gang was involved in Peak's disappearance. They would have set upon him somewhere along the dark pathway between Wiccan and Burwell. 
heavy agricultural boots and blind fists would have brought severe damage upon the officer. It is believed that if this was the case, then he would have been carried or placed on an arm barrow to a convenient deep pond and thrown in. The slit and weeds would have enveloped his body and prevented it from rising as gases build up during the process of decay. Of course, such was the reputation of the gang that none of these ideas would dare be put forward to the authorities that the Fen Tigers had been responsible for the murder. Although this theory could have come possible when a human skeleton was reported to have been found in a pond near Wiccan in the 1880s. The finders noticed that there was evidence of extensive damage to the skull. For whatever reason, the skeleton was returned to its watery grave, thus ensuring that the mystery of the disappearance would most likely remain forever unsolved. Cambridge Crimes Vanished into the Dark Told and researched by Fonz Chamberlain